I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of e-commerce agency Electric. And today I'm talking with Matt Barr, CEO of Faring, formerly Enquire Labs, a marketing insights technology company that we use across almost all of our Shopify brands that we work with at Electric. Uh, Thanks for coming on, Matt. Really excited to chat with you today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Excited to dive into it. So before we dive into some of the topics that I have for us today, can you give everybody just a quick background on on you, sort of how you got into the space, and then be like a brief overview on on what, I want to keep calling it Enquire, but what fairing is? (laughs) Yeah, totally. Yeah, so I got I got into e-commerce uh, back in 2010, 2011. Uh, had a small consultancy right out of college uh, with kind of an e-commerce veteran here in New York for a couple of years. Uh, did that for a few years uh, and then moved on to help start a headphone company here in New York called Master and Dynamic. Uh, I was running everything digital there, um, kind of owning that P&L, did that for two, three years, uh, and then left, uh, that company in 2016, really just to go out kind of on this more entrepreneurial journey, really wanted to get into tech and SaaS kind of in the e-commerce enablement, uh, kind of vertical, um, don't need to go too deep in it, but my current co-founder and I spent a couple of years, uh, in the same day delivery space, uh, never really found product market fit there. And then fairing formerly again, it was Enquire, then Enquire Labs. And now we have a, an actual brand, um, we launched uh, that in 2018. Um, so it's been a few years um, with the product and market. And for the first couple of years, it was very much just a side project. I think we did the typical the typical joke is if if it pays for kind of dinner a couple of times and beers, we'll, we'd be happy. <laughs> um, and fast forward to today, yeah, we work with about 2,500 different brands um, and serve yeah, about a half a million questions a day. So it's, it's definitely morphed into something a bit bigger than we initially anticipated. What was the initial sort of idea or inception of, of Enquire? Yeah, so we were we were advising this handbag company here in New York called Kara. Uh, low seven-figure company, was having trouble with attribution. Uh, and really just to get a level set for them, we suggested that they go at a survey post-purchase. Um, mm-hmm. At the time, the way we did it, funny enough, was we used this app, I forget the name of it, that allowed you to easily embed HTML. Now you can do that natively with Shopify. And then we embedded a Google form onto their order confirmation page. Uh, And like a week into that, Aaron, their CEO was like, this data is incredible. Um, But the issue was that it lived in an iframe, which means that it wasn't communicating with the e-commerce site. So we didn't really know who Mm. was submitting the responses. So like he, I think he got one that said like, I met Aaron last night at a party. So great kind of thing. And he was like, who said this? And we were like, we have no idea. Like it could be anyone. We could look at the timestamps, but you've done a bunch of orders today. So that was really the inception of, hey, can we just build a very simple post-purchase form that marries e-com data with survey data? Got it. Got it. And where do you think like the product is is going? Like I know you've been expanding upon the, the post-purchase survey a little bit, but is there anything that, that you can share in terms of uh, what some next logical progressions would be with, with fairing? Yeah, we're, we're really positioning ourselves as a new data source. Um, so okay. surveys historically have always been in kind of what we call the research corner, which essentially means like they're always like you do them maybe quarterly, you get a PDF, maybe you action on them. And yeah. what we're building towards is allowing fairing to eventually live everywhere. And then whether it's for kind of real-time decision-making with our analytics or, and reporting, or it's feeding that into your existing marketing stack, um, we see kind of the future of like this customer input direct from consumer is kind of the phrase that we use often, um, helping kind of feed all decisions uh, within kind of the e-com and beyond. So as far as like where we're going towards, uh, we already have question stream live, which today is like, it's still fairly new. Um, it's been in market for less than a year today. Um, and the real kind of insight we had there is surveys have always been like this monolith. It's this question, this series of call it five to 10 questions. And there was no way to kind of break those apart and serve them over time. So if, for example, if Brandon answers two questions, there's, they're very difficult to get answers, call it three through 10 without creating a whole new survey. 
Um, so what we've done with question stream is really like broken questions out from one another um, and they each have their own rules. So as you get to like where this is moving towards is kind of programmatic asking of questions, living on multiple surfaces um, mm -hmm. and really driving as much engagement um, as possible. Yeah, I mean, the ability for us to target even like new versus returning customers is, is invaluable because obviously you want to ask people different things. But I think it would be cool if like we could ask somebody who is maybe a subscription customer or certain questions versus somebody who isn't a subscription customer. And I can see how you could just continue to build out more logic around like who sees what and when. But exactly. Like you're providing the tools to operate, operate. Goodness, operationalize. Really. Yeah, operationalize. Yeah. Trust me, I, I try to say that every day and I can't. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good with the buzzwords, but I guess I'll have to practice that one. Um, so how you, you're enabling, we're just going to say you're enabling consumer data to be yeah. collected by these brands, but how, like, where do you step in and actually help them realize this is how, or because for me, a lot of times I've heard like, oh, like that's an attribution tool, but they don't necessarily think about it in terms of like a zero party data play or yep. how it flows in the Clavio and what they can do with retention personalization. So how much of your time and efforts are spent on like education and enablement versus versus getting people on the platform? Yeah, it's we're like moving in that direction. So uh Part of the reason why we, so we raised a, a proper seed round back in December. Um, and the real reason is kind of just to start pushing more on the enablement, kind of education, improving the product, the product onboarding experience. So today mm -hmm. we are very much a, uh, I don't say want to say we're positioned as an attribution tools, but as you alluded to, that's what everyone thinks of, thinks of us as. Um, over 90% of new customers, the first question they add to their question stream is still some version of how did you hear about us? Um, and it's about 80% of our total question volume a day. Um, but what we're looking to, to do is like improve all of our integrations, build deeper integrations with, you, with each platform and then build mm -hmm. tools within the product to then like recommend. So it's like, hey, you're a beauty company. Here's four or five questions and how you would kind of most likely call them recipes, how you might enable uh, those into your existing stacks. So like ask this question or this type of question connected to Clavio, And here's a flow, a Clavio flow template to put that to use right away. Um, so it's still fairly early. Uh, I, I think we're still kind of curious what you have to say to this, but I feel like we're still, still maybe in like year one of a multi-year kind of transition of brands really still relying on paid to drive, like be the main driver of action within an org. And I think that's going to start shifting towards kind of retention and kind of all of these brands are looking for a competitive advantage. And like your competitive advantage could come from your product. It could literally come from how you're managing your bid strategy. If you're doing that more effectively than others, yeah. it could also come from data that's directly from your customers, which none of your competitors can get. Um, so that's kind of one of the things we harp all the time is like build, how can brands build a competitive advantage kind of within their vertical? Um, and we like, that's part of the messaging that we're going to be pushing off and it's like ask questions that allow you to do that. Yeah. And being able to take those questions and actually act on them versus just asking them and then having them sit somewhere. Like I can't tell you how many brands, whether it's fairing or another tool, like an octane for quizzes, yep. they're collecting so much data, but they're not doing anything with it. So it's yeah. like, well, what's the point of even collecting the data? Because, I mean, I think like five years ago, it was a really cool thing to say like, oh, look at all this data that we have, but we're not actually doing anything with it. Oh, exactly. Um, yeah, we we talk about segment internally all the time uh, because it's very similar. Like you could set segment up, capture all these different events, but if you're not feeding those events into a BI tool or into other tools, you're just capturing events. Um, so right. it doesn't really, it's not very constructive. So totally, yeah, you're gonna, you'll, you'll see a lot from us, like as we enhance the question, our question stream kind of question engine functionality and then our integrations are going to get way more powerful. Yeah. I mean, that playbook will be very valuable for, for brands. They can just get in there and they're like, here it is already. Here's your three to five questions. Oh, to totally. ask. Here's the Clavio flow. That's going to help you with your retention. And I feel like the integrations are getting better and better amongst all of the tools that we typically use, which is coinciding nicely with the transition to focusing on retention. Because yep. reten the retention strategy is a lot easier when like we literally have every data point we could possibly need in Clavio, yeah. for example, to do our email and SMS and, and push, which is the main driver of, of retention for sure. Totally. And um, our, our Clavio integration is getting a, a small upgrade into how we pass data to them in the next couple of weeks, like solely for that. So it's just more 
uh, allows kind of the marketer to understand more about the data versus right today, mm-hmm. we just write to the customer properties. And honestly, I think paid is actually easier than retention because paid, there's a finite like period. You're in the discovery phase and you're, you're, you're getting sent to like direct response landing pages. You're either going to purchase, or you're not going to purchase. But once that purchase yeah. is done, then, then you're done. The paid was successful. Whereas retention, you have everywhere, like once that first purchase is made, all the way to order number 20, different product categories you can send people down, loyalty, referral programs, like it, it's just a, a mess of different things that you could try and implement. Totally. And I feel like there are features that are getting released that are making it easier for us, like Clavio's new A-B testing functionality. I can't tell you how much of a pain in the ass it was to like run at scale any sort of A-B testing strategy across retention flows because you have to like manually check when one was statistically significant versus another, then update it. You're pulling the reports, but now it's just going to be done in an automated fashion. All of that is going to enable us to actually be able to do like more with, with less time. Totally. Yeah. You know, there's just simple questions on our end too, around like from a segmentation standpoint, like that, I feel like that's always the hardest thing when you're kind of running any kind of email marketing campaign or strategy is like, how do you segment emails? Like it's typically yeah. like what someone purchased is kind of the easiest one, um, how often they purchase. And then kind of where we can come in is like, we have a, a large betting company we work with and they just ask like, why did you buy? And it's like quality price and a few other options. They feed that to Clavio, And then it's like, they have these, all of these cohorts based on, Hey, these are more price sensitive users. Let's send them discounts. These are more quality. Let's talk about quality. And it's just like, is a beautiful way to start segmenting emails and like implement a very on the surface, one might say a, ba- a basic level of personalization, but it's just quite easy to understand and execute for literally anyone. And I, I would say that's probably more advanced than 90% of, of what people, brands yeah. are doing. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <fair>. kudos <laughs> to them. But that's what, I mean, that's the, one of the more exciting parts about working with a new client is figuring out like, and I don't like to think about here's all the data that we can go and get. It's more of what would make this post-purchase experience more relevant for the customer? How, how how would we want to personalize it? And then once you know that, then you can figure out, okay, well, what like first or zero party data do I need to create those segments so that I can personalize it in that yeah. manner? So yeah. for example, like I always use skincare. I should probably come up with another example, but like for skincare, it's like, well, yeah, it'd be really great if after that first purchase, we knew skin type because we'll be able to personalize the retention journey thereafter with product recommendations. I was like, yep. okay, well, obviously we can't get that from uh, first party data. We're gonna have to get it from zero party data, but there's actually three different places where like we could get it. We have the question in the quiz. Mm-hmm. We have the question in the post-purchase survey. And then we even have the question in the review process with the Kendo too. All three of those potential opportunities to capture what skin type that consumer is and then that can funnel into being able to actually do the, the personalization yeah totally yeah no there's definitely those are definitely the the core main places to capture it today and that's that's kind of where we're where we're eventually moving towards is allowing capture at all those places or at least being able to like from a consumer perspective it's not great if like let's say an octane is capturing that and they're asked again immediately right. after they purchase um so those are the things that we're trying to be cognizant of um and almost, we like to think of it as like a customer profile. So let's say you have mm-hmm. these 10 things that you'd love to learn about a customer. Um, and then how do we, in a kind of smart fashion, capture that data and know like, hey, this percentage of your customers, we know 100% that of what we want to know. Um, just to give kind of like an index and allowing brands to understand like, okay, 80% of our customers, we know very, very little about, we know they bought X and they spent Y. Um, so that, that's one thing that we're moving towards is to help brands at least like visualize um, in a sense of what they know and, and honestly what they don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. And it would be great if there was some way to tie out like, oh, this person didn't answer it here. Let's ask them here again. Yeah. Or having like a, I've always thought the Shopify account profile is like super, super basic. I mean, there's, yeah, that, that could be like a hub for customer information. Totally. Would update and then you could, kind of do it with Clavio preference centers, but not even because it's not out of the box. You have to do it custom. Um, so there's definitely yeah, the customer, a- the customer meta fields. Um, 
is what we what we push at least on our end now. If you want to store that within Shopify, because it finally allows for that key value pair, where a lot of brands okay. historically tagged it or added it to tags, um, which again, like you're creating a key value pair in the tag, um, but it's not as easily pulled. Um, but the customer meta fields and order meta fields are a great place. Um, the only issue is again, it's not event data. So if you're asking a question multiple times, it's just going to get overwritten, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Yeah, that's true. So what are some of the best applications you've seen of your tool uh, in, in the marketplace from some of the brands that have that have leveraged it? Yeah, so we we kind of put things into four different buckets. So we have attribution, um, which I don't want to spend too much time on just because I feel like a lot of people have our highest use case today. Um, the second one's personalization. Um, CRO is another one, just simple questions like how is your shopping experience can go a long way. It's not even something you need to leave live or have enabled for a long time. You'll learn very quickly, like, hey, your return policy is confusing for a lot of users. And the fourth question is uh, just general customer research. Um, and some of the best use cases or the things that get mo us most excited, um, which is usually when a, a brand reaches out to us, is when you start leveraging kind of overlapping some of those things. So attribution is great, like understanding where customers come from, allowing you to reallocate your media spend. And a lot of people think about like that is quote unquote attribution. It's attributing sales to a channel. Um, but the exciting part is when you start layering that on. Um, and the example I give is we work with a backpack company here in Brooklyn. Um found out very early that TikTok um, was going to be an incredible channel for them. Their historical kind of go-to-market persona was this 34 to 40 year old male. And they started seeing all this traffic coming from TikTok, all these orders. They simply just added what we would call like customer demographic and research questions like age and gender into their question stream and quickly found out that they had a whole different customer. Where historic, like if they weren't actually asking customers, there's really no way for them to know that unless they were kind of using third-party purchase data from Experian or whatnot. Um, so that's like just a an example that we're starting to push and see often is, okay, you have your attribution layer, your attribution data. Now, like, what do you know about the customers that come from each of these channels, and how can that allow you to make better decisions? So that's a that's kind of a very not overly complex one, just to like more of a research kind of more so on the research side of understanding the channels yeah. um, i mean that's interesting though it could definitely help with your targeting strategy like oh totally oh, everybody who's coming through facebook or who's coming through google has x y and z attributes and then what yeah. is that then update your copy update your creative um i think we're we're going we're going back in time a little bit which is a good thing from an advertising standpoint of like I feel like five years ago, like you just didn't necessarily need to know your customer that well. Like, dare I say that? It was just like you needed to really optimize your bid strategy and your creative. Um, mm -hmm. And the amount of brands that like we advised to like had some semblance of a user profile or user persona, um, but never actually like put it to work. Um, and now, like, even questions for us, like, how would you classify yourself? If you could literally, if you have one question that allow you to build personas, um, you instantly can start bucketing people and then analyzing that from like LTV repurchase rate where they come from and like really start to optimize that more holistic marketing strategy based on these things. Um, so those are just kind of two examples that kind of fall in the same bucket of like getting actually getting to know your customer and then uh, kind of putting that work, putting that data to use in a more operational fashion. Mm -hmm. So I want to hop over quickly to the entrepreneurial side of things with you starting the company and, and building and growing it to this point. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll start with two. So like, number one, when did you realize that this wasn't just going to be something that was going to allow you to go buy a couple beers and you decided to take that leap to go full time with it? And then second, like, how did you go about sort of building your, your team? Like what were some key attributes that you looked for in terms of hiring? Because obviously those are some integral integral hires in, in the early stages of your of your startup. Yeah, totally. Um, so we've we've had a couple inflection points since May 2018 when we kind of pushed go live in the app store. Um, mm -hmm. The first one was in kind of Q4 2019. After this was out for about a year and a half, um, we looked at our customer base, and we had, I don't know at the time we maybe had seven eight hundred customers. And about half of them, which is main, maintained constant today, were on Shopify Plus. And that was like just a very clear indicator to us. It's like, okay, we're 
I think at the time we were charging like 10, 20 bucks a month, um, <laughs> which is uh, hilarious to think back. But um, that was like a good indicator for us. It's like, oh, we're actually servicing like a customer who has like a level of like, we're helping them make decisions at scale. So it's not just kind of a small 50, 100 order a month brand, which again, there's a ton of apps that um, those brands can those brands can use to kind of grow and scale. But for us, it was like, oh, we're working with brands that are doing like 50, $100 million and we're hearing from them all the time. So that was like a, that was a good, like really good indicator for us. And I think after about a year in, it was one of those things where it's like, we want to go full-time and then we just kept getting pulled back to consulting. Um, so we raised about 75K just in some angel money, mostly from customers um, at the time, which was like, give us a couple months. Um, and then in 2020, obviously e-commerce took off. We scaled quite well. Um, and then in early 2021, we were getting asked, like our most often feature request at the time was multi-question. And at the time, like, as you know, we were st still single question functionality with those follow-ups. Um, so again, same story. It's like, hey, we have we have something bigger here. We need a little bit more cash. At the time, it was still just Kurt, my co-founder and I. Um, so we raised about 400K from a bunch of just the founders of Postscript, some guys from Recharge, so a whole slew of kind of e-commerce, um, uh, just e-commerce players uh, in the SaaS space um, and started building multi-question. And then the final leap, which is uh, like definitely our biggest leap was last summer, we started getting all this inbound from non-commerce, um, like FinTech, B2B SaaS, um, which we still get a lot today. And that was the realization for us of like, oh, what we've built with asking questions to customers can like work in any vertical. Like you could download DoorDash and we could power questions in a very programmatic way as you're onboarding. Um, so that was kind of the leap where we went and raised, we raised four and a half million in December, um, which really was the pitch of like, okay, this isn't just a e-commerce centric problem to solve. This is more wide. So that's been our journey as far as like, I'd say we're somewhat pragmatic in how we think about things. It definitely wasn't always a, a go big or go home kind of um, mm -hmm. strategy here. Um, so it's, it's been great. Like uh, as far as seeing that lineage for us and our volume and customer count increasing with that. Um, and then on the team side, uh, we were essentially a two person team until Q4 of last year. Um, so we scaled to about, I don't know what it was, 1500 customers or so just, just Kurt and I, um, so we're, we're about like eight months into building the team. And for us, like we just built a couple heuristics internally. Like we really want curious people on board. We want we want to hire as senior as possible early. Um, kind of senior independent contributors is really what we were looking for. Um, so the team today is eleven. About half of that is engineering. Um, we're built. Uh, not to go too deep on the language side, but we're built using Elixir, um, which like is notorious. Like WhatsApp was built on kind of. Uh, Erlang, which is what Elixir is built on. So we're built for high volume scale. So we, we've we never really had any problems from a scale perspective, at least with serving questions. Um, so it's been really exciting to meet all of these engineers who kind of have a very vertical specific um, experience. Um, and then the other side, like nothing makes me more excited than getting awesome team members who could start to a provide a better experience to our customers. And then also like we could start delegating too. So I'm not doing everything. So we have a <laughs> head of customer success. Who's like two months in, who's now starting to talk to customers. We have a head of partnerships, um, all these things yeah. that honestly weren't getting enough attention. So it's been, it's definitely been a journey, uh, over the last four or so years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's allowed Kurt and I's kind of day to day, day to day to, to kind of change every so often, which I think is very important um, just from like a general like burnout perspective. Yeah, you know, I think it's pretty unique because there's, you don't have to go and raise like a hundred million dollars to be a Shopify app and to be successful. Like there also is a much more like methodical and pragmatic way to do it without potentially losing your shirt because you went and raised too much money. And so I think you're probably in a pretty strong position now versus yeah. if you would have gone out and tried to be something that maybe you weren't ready for in that time and in that moment so yeah and we have like one of the we have revenue which is great you know there's a lot of companies that raised a ton before that um which has just taken a lot of the pressure off um so i, I think the fundraise for us was exciting because it we did this shift from having to be like overly frugal around how we spend money to being overly ambitious with how we think about product. And that's like a mm -hmm. really exciting transition versus like, Hey, we can hire the smartest people um, and kind of build this really awesome core team, which we couldn't do prior to raising any capital. Right. That makes sense. 
what are are you all remote uh so we have about half the team here in new york um okay. so actually seven of us are going to dinner tonight which is the most that we flew our designer in from uh St. Louis. So we're all, it's our first like actual team outing, which we're all, everyone's super excited about. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I, uh, we did an in-person last December and it was super weird because we are very remote and like meeting some people for the first time. Some people were shorter than you would have thought. Some people oh, yeah. were much taller than you would have thought. Like that was the, that was the, the funniest part for me. Like one of our developers was literally a giant. And I'm like, dude, I yeah. never would have expected this, but um, no, I totally. It's nice that you're in person, though. There's like a lot of. Uh, I personally am not a huge fan of remote, and yeah. I think even like some team members and, and and employees in general are starting to pull back from it because you're missing out on so much collaboration and just what sort of made the office environment special and unique. I think yeah, the hybrid this, hybrid would probably be the way to go. The serendipity for us is like what is so good about in-person. And we we have, so funny enough, I, I live in lower Manhattan now. I'm moving to Connecticut, like an hour outside the city next Thursday, like permanently with my wife, um, which will be a big transition after a, oh, a decade congrats. plus year. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're excited to get a little bit more space. Uh but we have a couple people in Jersey, like two people in Jersey who are about an hour out, um, one in Brooklyn or two in Brooklyn. So like Wednesdays, like our data all come in and collaborate. Some people come in more, some people come in less, but that yeah. kind of transition has been, has been definitely really helpful. Yeah. It's nice to have like that one hub that everybody can, can come to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Are there, is there like one last tip or trick or suggestion that you give to any brand listening other than going and downloading <laughs> fairing on the app store that uh, you think could help them in their, their post-purchase strategy? Yeah. I think like the one thing I mentioned this before uh, is, is how we really want to position ourselves as like a whole new data source. Um, so you think about your Google analytics data and that's how we want our brands that we're working with to think about like similar to that in the sense of it's this new whole source that is coming directly from your customers. Um, so it's not, you're not looking at kind of anything that maybe like Facebook is calculating from a ROAS perspective. Like you're getting input directly from um, the people that make your business thrive and thinking about that data in a very kind of always on kind of how do you action it, whether it's Clavio, which again, like if, if customers are using fairing or whatever tool and, and aren't connected to Clavio, like that would be the first thing I would do. I think you guys have seen some really good kind of ROI um, out of doing that, but just really thinking about survey data and like opening up how you're thinking about it is, would be my one suggestion. And everyone again is trying to build that competitive advantage. And like, mm -hmm. this is the easiest way to do it. Like you can hire a bunch of data scientists and dive deep kind of into the numbers and whatnot and build a competitive advantage that way. Um, but when everyone is using all of the same tools, like everyone's looking at all of the same dashboards, one of the easiest ways to do that is actually start talking to your customers, understanding them better, and then marketing them in a very personalized way. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you for coming on. Can you let everybody know where they can find you uh, online? Yeah, totally. I'm on, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's just Matt Barr or Twitter. It's Matt R. Barr. Um, feel free to kind of DM me. Uh, again, I mentioned before, I've been in commerce for over a decade. Uh, always happy to chat. Anything e-commerce kind of retail related, whether it's fairing or not, um, but always exciting to connect. So don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, yeah, thank you, Brandon, for uh, having me on. Yeah, of course. And what do you, um, for fairing, what's the uh, site so we can make sure we can pull uh, it? It's just fairing.co. Okay. Yeah. Nice and simple. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get the dot .com one day. <laughs> yeah, that's what I just looked up, actually. And I was like, I, this is not what I was yeah, expecting. Yeah, it's... It's incredible the like when you do a rebrand and we went through a bunch of names before doing this, like the amount of times you find something and it's great. And then you find like another SaaS company literally with the same name and fairing, which like if you're ever on an airplane, a uh, fairing is essentially any, any object that's added to another object to make it air, more aerodynamic. Um, so some like really good metaphors with what we're doing with surveys, um, like on an airplane wing, those like big, long things that you're like, what is that? Like, that doesn't look like it solves any purpose. It's called a fairing. Um, hmm. And during the brand process, uh, like nobody is touching this word. So it's been like 
we like go to create accounts we're like ooh slack, fairing.slack.com is available it's like all these different places we weren't expecting it um but the dot com um yeah when I, hopefully he's not listening to this <laughs> so that he knows we want it um but in the future we'll definitely be uh, reaching out yeah you did not raise the seed round that was a no we did not we're never raising any more money <laughs> <laughs> well uh Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Matt, for coming on. Uh, as always, uh, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com or electricmarketing.com. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.